Welcome to everyone here. Welcome to everyone online. Uh, this is the latest installment of the Fall 2023 webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project at UCLA Law. I'm Rick Hassan. I uh, direct the project. I want to thank Carly Ham and Ben Austin DeCampo and our AV team for their logistical support today. We did manage three minutes late to get all the connections going. Let me just tell you before we um, turn to today's program about two upcoming projects of the program. On Friday, October 20th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, that's this Friday, we're going to hold a virtual conference on the law and politics of potentially disqualifying Donald Trump from running for president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. We've got people on all sides of that issue talking about law and politics uh, of that issue. Um, it will That will run from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time. And then on November 16th at noon Pacific time, Pam Fessler, formerly of NPR, will be moderating a great panel called Covering the Risks to Elections on the State and Local Level, Views from Beat Reporters. And then we'll hear from Jonathan Lai of Politico, Karen Levine of Vote Beat, Patrick Marley, and Yvonne Winget Sanchez, both of the Washington Post, formerly of the Milwaukee Journal Festival and the uh, Arizona Republic. To sign up for all of these events, go to the Safeguarding Democracy Project website which is safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. All the events are free, but registration is required. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Genevieve Lackier and Eugene Bollock for a conversation on the Trump prosecutions, the First Amendment, and election interference. Hard to think of two experts who are better suited for this discussion, and hard to think of better timing since we got a <laughs> gag order from the judge about two hours ago, which I sent to the um, two panelists. Uh, Genevieve Lackier, joining us on Zoom, is Professor of Law, Herbert and Marguerite Freed, teaching scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. She teaches and writes about freedom of speech in American constitutional law. Her work examines the changing meaning of freedom of speech in the United States, the role that legislatures play in safeguarding free speech values, and the fight over freedom of speech on social media platforms. Her most recent articles on the First Amendment have appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, and the Yale Law Journal Forum. Eugene Volokh, uh, who many of you know here in the room, is Gary T. Schwartz, Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA Law School, soon to be emeritus and joining the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He teaches First Amendment Law in a First Amendment amicus brief clinic at UCLA School of Law, where he's often taught copyright law, criminal law, tort law, and a seminar on firearms regulation policy. He's authors of textbooks on the First Amendment and academic legal writing, as well as 90 law review articles including key articles on the First Amendment. So I'm gonna to begin today with some questions and then I'll take questions from the live audience here. Um, I cannot take questions, uh, unfortunately, they're coming over Zoom today. Um, welcome to you both, thank you for coming. And I thought I'd start off by having you each speak for about five to seven minutes on this opening question. We've never had a, a situation where a presidential candidate is the subject of multiple criminal proceedings during an election nor have we had a candidate saying disparaging things about those prosecuting him during an election because there have been no prosecutions. How should the First Amendment figure into how these cases are handled in terms of gag orders, et cetera? And let me start with Genevieve. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to be here. Only If only I could be in the California sunshine in person, but I'm stuck in cold Chicago and here with you uh, virtually. Um, well, I guess I'm going to change the question a little bit and say, how is it likely to play out and how should it play out? Because I think it is important when thinking about this whole network uh, complex of issues to think about the First Amendment, I think, in two dimensions. So first is just the First Amendment as a um, as a legal doctrine, as a set of legal tools that are actually going to be used by courts and other uh, players to limit or structure what happens. But then equally important, I think, is the First Amendment as kind of overhang as a set of arguments that Trump himself is gonna be using throughout, I think, uh, the campaign as itself um, a sort of political tactic that, and I think these two interact. My um, understanding is that up until now and almost certainly going forward, the relevant players, the prosecutors, the judges, the decision makers in various forms are gonna be aware of the way in which Trump and other political actors are going to use the specter of the First Amendment to attack them, to say this is a, you know, un-American uh, campaign of censorship and silencing. And are, I, I think so far and uh, going forward, um, I imagine it's going to be constrained, of, you know, the way in which the um, legal tools at their disposal are going to be used are going to be 
um, with this in mind to some degree. I mean, I think we already know that Trump is fundraising off the gag order. And so I, interestingly enough, I mean, I guess it's a sign of the success of America's free speech culture and our rich political tradition that even while we have these sort of legal fights about the First Amendment, there's this political fight in which Trump is making hay, using a, a great deal of expressive freedom to complain about how his First Amendment rights are being uh, criticized. And so this is both a political and a legal matter. Now, just turning to the law, which is my specialty because I'm no um, expert on uh, the politics of it. Um, so some of this, you know, as uh, Professor Hassan noted, you know, it's just we, this is novel territory. And so I think there are a lot of legal questions out there. Um, I imagine that the Trump campaign is going to be challenging basically everything on First Amendment grounds. I imagine that the um, lawsuit, uh, the D.C. Circuit case um, that um, out of which this gag order came, that the, one of the primary defenses are going to be First Amendment defenses. Um, I imagine the gag order is going to be challenged. Um, just speaking to the gag order where we're beginning. You know, uh, I guess I'll tell an optimistic story, which is that. We live in a period where the First Amendment is an incredibly powerful instrument of constitutional litigation. And the way in which it gets invoked, both in the cases and outside the cases, is in these very absolutist terms. You know, the court, especially Justice Thomas, I think, on the court, but many members of the court speak in these sort of resounding, poetic, but very broad uh, terms about what freedom of speech means in the American tradition and uh, invoke a specter of the First Amendment that applies equally everywhere. Um, but I think in practice, the doctrine is way more nuanced than that and is flexible to accommodate a lot of the real world constraints on or the real world considerations when it comes to speech. And we know from the history of um, you know, the First Amendment as it enters the field of the criminal law, that courts are very sensitive to the ways in which what the speech environment that occurs in a courtroom and about what happens in a courtroom is just different than ordinary public sphere of speech. That the, um, as I think Judge Chutkin said in this case, um, you know, the First Amendment, you don't have the same First Amendment rights when it comes to uh, either what you say in court or what you say outside of it about court as you do in the public sphere. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have any First Amendment rights at all. And I think it is important to remember that. And I think it's a very good thing. Um, I was actually just rereading this morning in preparation for this, uh, this event, uh, Bridges v. California, the 1940s case in which the court says that the First Amendment protects the right of a litigant in a case to criticize the judge in that case and invokes the sort of very important um, news uh, public value in speech about the trials and about um, what happens in court. And so and litigants have First Amendment rights, but they are different than the First Amendment rights you have as a participant, an ordinary participant in public discourse. And so I am hopeful that through the, I think, uh, many, many First Amendment challenges, disputes and adjudications that we're about to see, you know, on the one hand, um, the fact that Trump is the defendant in so many criminal trials is a really interesting uh, product of the extraordinariness of Trump. Uh, criminal law, the particular constellation of political factors that led us here, but it's also going to be, I think, a First Amendment story. I think there's going to be First Amendment questions raised throughout all of these uh, in various ways in many of these trials. Um, and I'm hopeful that the way in which the First Amendment actually gets utilized is in a relatively nuanced way, because what we are talking about is the ability of the government to maintain uh, aster you know, this is all complicated, asterisks, um, a fair and impartial uh, procedures of justice where uh, members of the jury, the uh, attorneys, the staff members are not intimidated and harassed for doing their jobs and in which it is impossible to get a fair trial. I think the courts are going to be quite um, vigorous in trying to defend the ability of there to be something like an impartial and fair administration of justice, even in a hyperpolarized social media age. And so in that context, uh, I would imagine that there will be recognition that there are, can be constraints on pure expressive freedom when necessary to maintain the integrity of the procedures. And so, um, you know, I was just looking at the gag order. Um, and, you know, what's so interesting about the gag order is it's a relatively nuanced order. It only limits, and it's very clear, and here I think we're seeing the First Amendment overhang, the first paragraph of the order says what all interested parties in this matter, including uh, Donald Trump, are prohibited from saying. They may not make public statements um, about the special counsel or the defense counsel or the staff or reasonably foreseeable witnesses. I note it's very um, noteworthy, striking that the judge did not include herself. 
And this is partly perhaps because this idea that judges should be, this is their job, they should be tough. And Bridges, the court says, we shall presume that judges are wise and firm. They're not so easily swayed. But then in the second paragraph, the, the order goes out of its way to say, this doesn't mean that the parties, including Trump, may not make statements criticizing the government or assert the defendant's innocent or that the prosecution is politically motivated. And so even the gag order is trying itself to take account of the First Amendment interest here and craft something that is relatively nuanced. To me, it doesn't seem constitutionally problematic. I'm sure it's going to be challenged. Uh, but I think it is actually quite useful in an era of First Amendment absolutism to see and to have to work through this kind of nuanced approach to what free, free speech means. I have some follow-up questions, but let me get uh, Professor Volokh uh, first uh, in on this. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So uh, can we use first names? I think we've known each other long enough. Well, Genevieve Rick and set I the were, tone. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I yes. I no, no. Let's Genevieve, use first name. Yeah. Rick, Eugene, Genevieve. That's there great. you go. There you go. Wonderful. You, know, you were going to say we were classmates in, yeah, exactly. in, in he, Professor Lowenstein's election law class in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Yes. Um, uh, so, so there's very much to what Genevieve says. And uh, uh, I, I agree this is an important and complicated question. I want to just make a few observations. Um, one is, it's always risky to make predictions, but I'm almost certain that this is not going to be the last such situation. Jonathan Rausch, who is a, I think a very insightful scholar of American politics, once wrote, Washington, D.C. is an Old Testament town, very much eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, once a precedent is set, and I don't just mean a legal precedent, I mean a political precedent. Precedent actually does operate outside, I think, of the of our legal system, uh, because I think it matters. Precedent and analogy matter to how people think through things. Uh, it's going to become much more normal. It's going to be become much more a tool in someone's political in people's political arsenals to try to get a political enemy prosecuted. Now, to be sure, I'm no supporter of, uh, of Donald Trump's. I think he's certainly made it very easy to prosecute him for various things. But I think many a politician has done some things that somebody could say is close to the line and over the line. And and what's more, we're seeing here that the prosecution isn't even all going to be centralized in the Justice Department. You could have state level prosecutions as well. Uh, the particular gag order came in a federal case, but there's of course uh, uh, there are of course state cases, and you know you could certainly imagine somebody uh, who is an attorney general or even a local attorney. Often in many states, it's not subject to the control of the attorney general, saying, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna." Uh, well, saying, maybe not even thinking, maybe even just subconsciously thinking, you know, this is my opportunity to get on the national stage, to strike a blow for what I think is right, uh, to go after an enemy of the nation. Uh, even well-intentioned politicians, it seems to me, can, might end up trying to do that even in borderline cases. And of course, politicians are not limited to the well-intentioned ones, right? So one thing we need to think about is try to, as with many of these situations, distance ourselves from Trump and our views about Trump and ask what happens when this is done to somebody else, because it's going to be done to somebody else. It's going to be done at the lower level, uh, that is to say, the look beneath the, the presidential races, but it's, I think, also going to be done with presidential races. The second thing to say that, that, that I think is worth keeping in mind is Let's just, again, abstract a little bit from this, and we'll get to the concrete and ask, what should be people's rights to speak out about what they think are patent injustices in perpetrated by the government through the most important of government processes that may in fact undermine or undermine affect the result of an election? Even people who don't think of themselves as First Amendment absolutists, not that really that term means anything in my view, but people who don't think of themselves as First Amendment maximalists might say, well, that surely is the heart of, what's, uh, of what the First Amendment ought to be about. You can debate how it should affect a wide variety of other things that are tangential to, that, uh, to, to such matters. But when the claim is some person is being railroaded in a way that, uh, that affects an election, uh, then it seems that 
pretty, pretty good argument that notwithstanding the possible harms that such claims can make, whether to people's trust in government or whether to the judicial process or whatever else, that should be the core of what the First Amendment protects. And that's, of course, what Trump is saying, that this prosecutor, and note he, can't, he cannot make public statements that target the special counsel, so he can't say this prosecutor is railroading me. He can't make statements that target any reasonably foreseeable witness or the substance of their testimony. So you can't say prosecutor is going to bring in this person who says this and that substance is all false. Not allowed to do that. So the third thing you might ask is, what about you and me? Well, maybe the judge doesn't care about you and me. What about prominent media organizations? What about other political figures? Because if you really are concerned about the danger that uh, speech might undermine the, the process by making, by intimidating the prosecutor or intimidating the witnesses and such, that could just as much be if some, uh, some influential other politician says that. In fact, maybe the very fact that it's coming from a third party might make it more credible and thus people more likely to act out against, against the target. So what if a newspaper or a, a cable television uh, uh, channel decides to say that? Uh, I take it we'd say, even if we're not First Amendment absolutists, wow, it should take a lot before this kind of gag order can be imposed on the newspaper. A gag order could be imposed on uh, so somebody else, with, uh, whether they're running for president or not. So one possible response is, well, this is different because this is a gag order on the defendant and not on the media. And indeed, similar arguments have at times been accepted in particular contexts. The most obvious one is about lawyers. One of the things you're going to need to learn when you become lawyers is you can indeed be limited in your ability to speak out uh, about pending proceedings that you are a lawyer in. There's a case in that Gentile v. State Bar. But the whole premise of that case was precisely that being a lawyer is a sp provides special benefits that come with special obligations. So you distinct the courts distinguish the lawyer from the newspaper in that respect. Uh, likewise, uh, there certainly are gag orders all the time restricting litigants and their lawyers, but even just in litigants, from disclosing things that are disclosed that, that they learn through discovery. The theory being that discovery isn't supposed to be a means that you can rummage around your adversary's files and publish it in your newspaper. Even if you're a newspaper, you could be gagged that way. But again, the theory is, look, you got a little benefit. You got access to other parties' private uh, records. One constraint is you can't then turn around and use it for purposes other than litigation. Well, the one person who's getting the least benefit in the judicial process is the defendant, right? It's not even like a plaintiff where you might imagine in a civil case a plaintiff, you know, you want to take advantage of the court system. You've got to, you've got to uh, uh, accept some restrictions. The defendant is being dragged into court. The defendant is the one who is saying this is... A, this is a travesty of justice. The special counsel is uh, is corrupt. The uh, substance of the uh, of the witness's testimony is all going to be false. Uh, and again, the question that arises from a First Amendment perspective or a broader free speech perspective: Why should we limit the defendant, who again is completely involuntarily there, any more than we would limit the media or other influential institutions? Now, one possible answer maybe there should be more gag orders on the media. In fact, that used to be the rule in various ways that's been substantially cut back um, uh, or another possibility maybe well there's something special about being a defense right once we find probable cause to believe you're guilty we should limit your ability to say no 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 i'm innocent for the following reasons or maybe just the danger to the judicial process is just so grave that it needs to be uh this kind of the order needs to be accepted but despite i think well the, what genevieve said there's a lot of uh, makes a lot of sense i do think that there's a real problem when we allow judges to say whether to the media or to other politicians or to the politician who happens to be the one who was dragged into court against his will uh you cannot say these things while criticizing government officials government processes which you think are going to work a grave injustice and interfere with the election well, thanks for that let me ask you each somewhat different follow-up questions based on what you said uh Genevieve, i'm putting on my hat as a remedies person more than the First Amendment person, I'm looking at the text of this order. And I'm wondering if it's unconstitutionally vague. It says you can't make a statement or cause someone else to make a statement that targets the special counsel. 
Does that mean you can't mention the special counsel? I mean, what is targeting me? I imagine Trump's going to go right up to the line. Would a retweet of someone saying that Jack Smith is a liar be Trump speaking? Is this going to be workable? And what are we going to do about holding him in contempt? And then I'm just going to preview my question for Eugene is going to be, do you think that um, if there were evidence of a defendant, doesn't have to be Trump, intimidating witnesses, you know, if you, if, if you, testify at the trial, you're good, bad things are going to happen to you, that that would be good enough grounds to, to gag. So let me turn to Genevieve first. Okay, well, I'm just going to make a quick comment about what Eugene said that'll segue nicely into my answer to you, Rick, so I'm, that's I'm justifying it, which is just to say that, you know, in terms of the doctrine, the courts have distinguished between gag orders on press and gag orders on litigants. And I think the general rule now understood to be is it's pretty much an absolute rule against any gag orders on the press. Like the courts cannot gag the press, they can gag litigants. And this view was because the press plays some kind of gatekeeping role. It's a little bit thoughtful or careful about how it represents events. And so we just, on the whole, it's better to just let the press do its own thing because it's different than the litigants who have a very, you know, who may not be the greatest people on the planet or may not have the most judicious views of what to say or what not to say. Um, I think you know, the story I told in my opening remarks were, was a story of stability. You know, the, the First Amendment has always had play in the joints and we should, we're going to see that now and that's going to be a good thing. But it also could be a story of updating that the rules we have are written for a pre-social media age that assume there to be a meaningful difference between a litigant who's not a member of the press and the press when we're thinking about gag orders. And with Trump, who is his own press machine, you know, he's the tweeter in chief until he was kicked off. And now I guess he's the truth socialer. And maybe also the tweeter, I don't know, um, you know, that we can clearly see that the social media rules may be different. And so we might see some evolution in the doctrine. I think that's part of a longstanding tradition, of course, trying to figure out the rules in light of existing social conditions, not necessarily bad, but it, it, it was a thing. I, I think it was worth mentioning. And I think it's a difficult and interesting question about whether this traditional uh, distaste for gag orders for the press, but for permission of gag orders for people like Trump, uh, litigants in the case, defendants, whether that still makes sense. I think it does, given the different relationship they have, the different function that they their speech is serving. Uh, but I recognize that it's a complicated question in light of the changing nature of speech and the social media platforms. Rick, on your really good question about is this vague and what are the remedies and what does target mean? Um, so I guess I will say, I think vagueness doctrine is pretty vague these days and courts <laughs> reach a lot of different views about what's vague and so... And this is a joke that always kills in class and that have vagueness doctrine is vague. It's killing in this room too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you know, why, why do I have my day job? I really should just do stand up. Um, but, but I guess, you know, I feel like given a kind of purpose oriented reading of the text, target means, and this is the reason I think the judge issued the gag order, not because she's worried about criticism of the trial. And that I think is what the second paragraph is trying to make clear. But because of this real concern about witness intimid um, party intimidation and harassment, and that is what target means. If you're going to make them the target of these kinds of campaigns. Now, what's complicated now, again, in a social media age is that I think all of this is against the backdrop of, I guess, often called like stochastic terrorism or stochastic har harassment. Like it's not necessarily going to be that Trump is the one doing all the harassing. Trump is going to be tweeting or speaking, and then his supporters will then take it upon themselves to do the harassing and intimidating. But this doesn't seem to me, I mean, I'm recognizing that vagueness doctrine is vague, and what's vague in my eyes may not be vague in yours. This doesn't seem to me unduly vague. It just seems to be marking the the purpose of the gag order, what it, the thing that it's worried about, which is also why it makes me feel a little bit better on First Amendment grounds. But it's true, this is going to be, this is written by and going to be interpreted by the judge. And then it's going to be uh, appealed if it's appealed and um, the DC circuit can make up what they, they can narrow it. Um, but, it, you know, interpreting the gag order uh, is one thing. I think the you uh, remedies <laughs> is going to be a very th a much more thornier question. I feel like it's probably possible, maybe useful for this to be slightly specified what the gag order is actually referring to. Although I think, I think we, I th yeah, I think it's not impossible to understand what it's refer the class of speech act it's referring to. How it's going to be enforced, you know, I don't know. Uh, fines is one thing, but if Trump continues to flout it, which I assume he will, given his past behavior. Can the judge order imprisonment of an ex-president and a candidate for president? That seems hard for me to believe. And so I do think that there's going to be 
a lot of struggles about remedies. Thank you. Um, so uh, I wanted to briefly respond to something that Genevieve mentioned. First, I should acknowledge there definitely are lower court cases that basically say we're going to treat defendants the same way we treat their lawyers. But again, that doesn't seem to, to me to fit well with uh, the rationale of the lawyer case of Gentile. There are some other cases. Uh, there's one I was involved with kind of as a, as a lawyer for one of the parties from the Fourth Circuit. It was a civil case, uh, Inray Murphy Brown, not a television character, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that basically said, no, no, these gag orders are subject to strict scrutiny like restrictions on other parties. And I'm also a little skeptical about claims that the press gets special protection because we trust them to be kind of honest gatekeepers. That's never been First Amendment law, uh, at least from the Supreme Court. Generally speaking, the court as early as the late 1930s, very early in the modern free, free speech, free press era, stressed that the freedom of the press protects the lonely pamphleteer who historically have not been seen as supposedly objective, uh, objective parties as much as a newspaper. Um, uh, more broadly, of course, many in the press are ideological. And it's not even just, well, what does the world come to these days? You know, I think nobody doubts that the New Republic or the National Review have historically been members of the press, even though they're ideological. Though to be sure, they tend to have pretty high standards, but a lot of newspapers in the past have been both ideological and kind of pretty fast and loose with uh, at least the rhetoric and often with the facts, regrettably. Um, more broadly, uh, of course, uh, uh, the is this issue doesn't just come up with regard to the press. Again, imagine it's some celebrity who has millions of followers or some politician that has millions of followers. Uh, again, it sounds to me hard for as a First Amendment matter to distinguish Trump from them. So then that, that leads to the question, what about witness intimidation? It's a very serious and important concern. I, I, I entirely recognize that it's important. But again, it arises not just with regard to defendants, right? Uh, imagine that somebody, and again, flip the, flip the ideology. Imagine it is a, um, a progressive candidate for president who is being prosecuted for supposed corruption of some sort in, in her previous, uh, 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 previous office. And uh, uh, imagine that uh, uh, a lot of progressives are extraordinarily angry at what they see as the railroading. And then somebody else, maybe one of her political allies or just some, uh, some uh, a newspaper, imagine, even publishes something and it says, and... You know, these witnesses, if, if you should, that if they perjure themselves, they should expect the wrath of, of people wanting justice. And then by any means necessary, with a picture of an AK-47, let's say. Um, pretty clearly, that would be intimidation of a witness, it seems to me. And it's not because it's the defendant. In this hypothetical, it's the newspaper. Conversely, if the newspaper says, look, there is this witness, himself kind of a political player, and we just think that, that, that everything the witness is going to be saying is perjury. And that's just the reality. And we've got to understand that a grave injustice is about to happen. Is that, might that be perceived as intimidating by the witness? Possibly. Might it be something that would lead some angry readers, a tiny fraction, but still a considerable number, to consider maybe threatening, because that's cheap and easy, but even violently attacking the witness? Regrettably possible. But I don't think we'd say, well, that's reason enough to have a gag order against the newspaper publishing uh, this editorial. And again, it's not clear to me why the defendant, the criminal defendant in the case, who has often as much at stake as the third party speaker, or actually has more at stake than the third party speaker, who, is, uh, who may know as much as the third party speaker, who, may not, who is obviously biased, but the third party speaker could be biased too, why they should be treated differently from the newspaper. So again, I think the rule ought to be, yes, there ought to be prohibition on outright witness intimidation, but while understanding that any criticism of a witness might potentially lead to violence against the witness, I just don't think that that can be enough. I do note that the uh, the order is written not to the defendant, but to all parties and their lawyers. I thought that was interesting. Uh, all parties of the United States of America? Yes. You and me? Uh, <laughs> where am I? No, 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 I'm just joking now. Uh, but, but right, but, the, but it's interesting because it's the prosecutors, they are subject to the genteel rules. And the defense lawyers probably would be too. Uh, so, 
Uh, so yes, that may be some some degree of asymmetry if you only gag the prosecutors, the defense lawyers, but not the defendant. So we spent more time on the gag order than I expected we were going to because I didn't know it was going to come down literally hours before our talk. So here are the other topics I want to hit before I get to your questions. One is about more broadly about Trump's conduct, whether he has a First Amendment defense substantively, not talking about the gag order anymore, but to claims of election interference, such as in Georgia. And then I want to talk about jawboning and uh, um, other forms of what uh, Trump has called election interference, which is uh, a potential cooperation between social media companies and uh, the government on what speech should be removed as potentially interfering with elections. So, and, and then I'll come to your question. So let me start with the issue of Trump's conduct. So um, Trump has this famous or uh, infamous phone call with the Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, and he says, uh, which he later calls the perfect phone call, uh, where he says, yeah, I just want you to find me 11,780 votes. And um, uh, this is being used as evidence that he was trying to uh, interfere in uh, the election, get the election thrown. And he was saying, no, he just wanted an honest count. But one of the things that we're already hearing from his defenders is uh, these activities in trying to speak to election and elected officials in a number of states, that this is all First Amendment protected activity. And let me start with you, just talking about it, not necessarily the Raffensperger call in particular, but at a general level, do you think that, um, look, where do we draw the line between speaking uh, to uh, people to make sure that votes are being fairly right. counted and crossing the line into trying to pressure them into changing votes illegally? Right. So that's a great question. And again, it's one that First Amendment doctrine has something to say about. Um, generally speaking, Soliciting a specific crime is itself a crime and unprotected by the First Amendment. And by the way, that doesn't require imminence the way that abstract advocacy of, uh, of crime would under Brandenburg. Generally speaking, if I ask you to do something that's criminal, even at some unspecified time in the future, uh, and I'm intending that you do that criminal thing, and it's something quite specific, not just you, we all ought to revolt against the government, but let's go and shoot this police officer or burn down this police station or something like that, that is a crime. So indeed, saying to someone, you know, you you ought to fake the records and get me declared as winner, that's solicitation. On the other hand, apparently Trump in the phone call says, there's no way I lost Georgia. There's no way we won by hundreds of thousands of votes. I just want to find 11,780 votes, which is one more than says we have, but probably we need. Yeah. That might be that what he's soliciting is not, is not a crime, but what he at least sincerely believes is lawful behavior. Do your job. Their votes are out there. Somebody's hiding them. They're the ones who are acting illegally. I want you to do the right thing. I'm petitioning the government for regret, redress of grievances in this respect. So how does one distinguish this? Because again, this issue comes up in a variety of contexts. You know, it's hard. It probably has to do with perception of, of uh, uh, with, with a judgment about what the speaker intended, coupled with a judgment about what the reasonable speaker would have understood the statement to mean. I think you'd need both. And both would have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. This isn't just about the words. If I were to say, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'm sure there's a million of votes out there for me. I'm absolutely positive. Why don't you find some for me? Maybe under the right circumstances, you might say, well, that's just, that's just covering a bad intention. On the other hand, you know, it may very, it, You'd have to have, again, proof beyond reasonable doubt, I think, that the intention was to produce something illegal. Now, here's another way of thinking about this that some people might consider. I just don't think it's the law today. You might say the problem is with calling up the guy in the first place. And the analogy is actually to judicial processes, right? If I am a litigant in a case and I call up the judge and say, look, uh, what the other side said is just completely wrong. I just want you. I'm being completely sincere. I really do believe that. I just want you to do the right thing and rule in my favor. The judge will say, wait a minute, that's an ex parte contact. You're not allowed to do that. On the other hand, in the in much of the, uh, so the legislative process, ex parte contacts, lobbying are actually pretty common. So you might imagine a rule that says, look, for this kind of fact-finding executive process, 
such as administering an election, you just shouldn't be able to have ex parte contacts at all. Anything that's said would at least have to be said in public with both sides being able to see it or in some filing that is that the other side succeed on. I just don't think that that's an existing rule. And that while it's an interesting question whether that would be a constitutional limitation on the right to petition the government for redress of grievances, I just don't think it's in play here. So that's the way I'd be thinking about this question. Genevieve. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree largely with Eugene, which is, but I guess I, I would just frame it a little bit differently, which is I don't think that there's an independent First Amendment problem with the prosecution of Trump for the phone call or for election interference uh, or for fraud in the state case, et cetera. I think that so long as he has proven to have had the intent to um, get the Secretary of State to make up votes for him, or to put forward a slate of fake electors, or to get Vice President Pence, I think was one of the allegations, to interfere or to not certify the election results in violation of the law. Um, and that was his intent. And, he, you know, um, and that's proven, and all the other elements of the crime are proven. I think that that under existing law and well-established law takes it outside the scope of the First Amendment. It's not protected speech. It's now a crime or maybe speech integral to crime or the same thing. Uh, I'm not so sure I agree with Eugene. Eugene, did you say that you think it not only has to have intended, but be understood to have this uh, criminal intent? Because I think it is possible to attempt to solicit without right. actually achieving solicitation. So the Secretary of State, as was the case yet, yeah. could, not, could be not solicited. <laughs> um, and it's still a crime. And so I don't think right. that that is required. I think we have to prove the prosecution has proved Trump's intent to solicit the crime. But then the First Amendment is not an independent bar. Now, the, this comes back to the First Amendment as overhang. I'm not sure. I'm curious to see how it proceeds, how cautious and conservative, what play, you know, how much there's this concern that the First Amendment is somewhere in the room. Um, I think it uh, presumably um, it is one reason why for the um, Jack Smith prosecution, the federal government didn't bring any kind of incitement charge. This was talked about beforehand, that the speech that Trump gave uh, before there was the invasion of the Capitol uh, was itself a kind of criminal incitement. Um, I think that's probably a good idea. As Eugene mentioned, the standard for incitement is much higher than the standard for solicitation or aiding and abetting or conspiracy because it's about abstract advocacy rather than specifically demanding, requesting, or participating in a criminal act. And so I think we already see the First Amendment overhang. But I don't think, actually, that the First Amendment issues here are so tricky, so long as you prove all the other things you need to prove to win the case. So ju just to uh, 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 respond to um, Genevieve's uh, excellent point about intention and their possible being attempt, even if the person isn't con uh, convinced to do what's solicited, I totally agree with that. You don't have to show that the person actually did what you asked them to do. So if you say, you know, I want you to kill this person and, and uh, the listener says no, you're still guilty of intent. I do think you'd need to show that a reasonable person would have understood the statement mm. as being, uh, uh, as being uh, um, a, uh, such, a, uh, uh, such a solicitation. And, um, and I, I, but I should say, there's very little First Amendment case law on the scope of solicitation exception. I think that sort of flows from the need to have some sort of objective constraint. So you can't just say, well, this person said something on its face, it seems completely innocent, uh, but we think the real reason was he was hoping to bring about uh, some specific crime. Uh, but uh, but it's an interesting it's an interesting question. I would say though that I think that this does go to the heart uh, of the, of the the prosecutions and the First Amendment defenses here. So just to give an example, I think simply if 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 the point is simply well Trump was trying to overturn the results of the election and that's a crime and anything he does in the course of that is impermissible. I, I just I just don't think that's right. Uh, I think that you can try to overturn the results of an election through constitutionally protected means and through constitutionally unprotected means. Constitutionally protected means might include trying to persuade a government official to do something that most of us might think is not legal, but that the government, but that the government, or not constitutional, but that is uh, 
um, that uh, uh, is ultimately up to the government, to the listener to decide what to do. Uh, likewise, if his, even if his big picture strategy was to try to get as many votes as possible uh, and uh, 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 that's that's okay if he's doing it by indeed asking people to do things that are that would be lawful, find things that he sincerely believes votes that sincerely he sincerely believes exist. So, but I, I think the difference between Genevieve and me may be very subtle here. I think we both agree that, for example, it's a statement like this: the real question is there are two possible interpretations. One is soliciting criminal conduct, another is soliciting lawful conduct, and that would make a big difference whether it's a matter of just criminal law or criminal law plus First Amendment law. Can, right, I, can I just add to that? No, no, just no. Really no quickly. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let, let Jim go ahead. Yeah. Just really quickly, because I, I don't want to be uh, read to suggest, again, go to Eugene's point about what, what a reasonable person would understand you to be saying. I actually think there are three separate ways in which you could be guilty of some kind of criminal activity based on just the kind of speech that Trump is accused of without violating the First Amendment. One is solicitation. Another is conspiracy where you're, and you know, conspiracy is one of the things that's being charged where together with others, you have a collective criminal intent you share and you're just working out the details or you're, you're creating that criminal intent. And mm -hmm. I think there are some speech acts that might go to that, not the Raffensburger call, but other ones. Um, and then I think, and this may be where Eugene and I disagree, but I think the case law, in particular a case called the United States v. Alvarez, which deals with the, st the constitutional status of false speech, Alvarez says, you know, false speech per se is not outside the scope of the First Amendment, but there are these historical forms of uh, sanction for false speech that causes certain kinds of very significant harms that is totally permissible, one of which being fraud. So to the extent that Trump was engaged in fraud, that is to say he was using deception to get something of benefit from another person who, if they had understood the true facts, would not have achieved it or would not have done that. Um, I think the fraud, fraud is a perfectly good analogy for some of the allegations uh, of the kinds of deceptive acts he was engaged in. Um, but I think any one of those is a perfectly legitimate constitutional basis for finding Trump guilty. They're just different theories of what's going on in the relationship between the parties. So Genevieve, can I just ask you, what do you think about the lower court cases? And I agree that they're not uniform and maybe yeah. the right answer is different that say that at least in the context of election campaigns, mm -hmm. laws banning fraud in the sense, not of financial fraud, but mm -hmm. false statements that are aimed at getting votes, which of course are a thing of value, are themselves unconstitutional. Uh, I mean, maybe they're wrong, but there are quite a few such recent cases that say that goes too far in punishing fraud. Yeah, I mean, I think this is where we might see some healthy evolution of the doctrine. I think in general, and I think you agree with me based on prior conversations, that speech, one-on-one -on -one speech that is private, that is about a transactional a particular thing you're getting the person to do is different than public discourse speech. So I don't love those cases, I have to say. <laughs> I think we should recognize fraud as fraud in lots of different contexts, but fraud that is a uh, false speech that is directed at voters, that's public discourse speech, that is the most protected kind of speech. The speech that is being uh, alleged here, interestingly enough, was not generally, uh, there's some of it, but the primary speech is not the public discourse speech. It's speech where you're trying to get the, the claims in the in the indictment are that uh, Trump was deceiving particular people in order to get them to do a particular thing, which seems like a qualitatively different kind of fraudulent activity. Uh, but I agree, those cases, this is going to, there's going to be really interesting First Amendment arguments being made on both sides. Right, we're we're going to we're going to run out of time, and I'm not going to get to your questions. I think I'm sorry to say, um, but maybe you can ask after. Um, I want to get to the, the kind of the other side, the other side of the election interference, which is um, the claims that policing what is seen as disinformation by social media companies and uh, the encouragement of government in removing election disinformation, false statements about how the election is run that were appearing on social media, that that itself is a form of election interference. And so I think kind of there are two questions. One is, uh, should social media companies have the constitutional right to remove speech of politicians that it uh, thinks is um, uh, objectionable or dangerous, even if state law says they can't, as in the net choice cases that are now pending before the court? And what about jawboning? What about the government coming in and saying to a company, you really should remove this speech because it's dangerous. 
Where is that line? And let me start with you this time. Sure. sure. Um, so these are both very complicated questions. And you have four minutes sure of the answer. <laughs> you each have about four minutes. So, so as to the favorite. first, um, you might think of the spectrum. On one hand, there are newspapers or magazines which of course have a First Amendment right to decide what to publish and what not to publish. And in fact, we count on them to try to avoid publishing things that are false. Not even knowingly false, we count on them to investigate. Right? So, so if social media platforms are like them, then of course they have the First Amendment right to do the same. Here's the other side, phone companies. Imagine a phone company says, you know, there's a, this party has this uh, uh, get out the vote drive or some sort of, uh, not even get out the vote, some sort of uh, hotline that it uses to spread its messages. I think they're false. We think they're false and they're awful. They're horrible people. They're Nazis. They're communists. We're just going to cancel their phone line because we don't want our property to be used to transmit all of the speech. Well, they don't have the right to do that. They're common carriers. And by the way, not just monopoly landlines, but also the famously competitive cell phone companies. Or to take another example, in California, the rule is large shopping malls have to allow on a content neutral basis speakers to come onto their property and, and uh, leaflet. Interestingly, they came out in 1980 where the leafleters were leafleting about, uh, about Israel and about Palestinians and uh, the tension uh, uh, there. Uh, so everything old is new again. If today a, a shopping mall were to say, we're not going to allow this speech because it says false things about Israel or false things about Hamas, you know, it can, they can't do that. So the question is, where do you put this? social media platforms on that spectrum. Here's the, the question about the jawboning. On the one hand, it seems to perfectly normal for, let's say, the government to call someone up, let's say media, and say, I hear you're about to publish this article. It's just false. You, you just screwed up, or you called someone, and they told you something that was wrong. And it's provably wrong. I'll show you why it's wrong. I'm not trying to force you to do anything. You want to publish, fine, but it's going to be bad for me. It's going to be bad for you. You guys are going to look like idiots. Seems to me that that probably happens in one form or another, not infrequently. Often it'll be a call from the reporter. The reporter calls up saying, we need to check these facts. Well, they're not facts, and here's why. You shouldn't publish this article. So that's a very plausible argument for why the government should be free just to speak. Isn't that the government's own freedom of speech? Let me just close with one analogy. And you decide how close it is. I don't know how close it is. So I happen to own some rental properties. And let's say the police department called me up and says, Volok, we know you're a good citizen. We know you just want to do the right thing. So what we'd like to do, we think that one of your tenants is committing some crime. We can't get in there because we don't have enough probable cause to get a warrant. But we'll just ask you. We're not forcing you to. If you say no, we understand. But we're hoping that because under your lease, you're allowed to go onto the property and uh, inspect periodically, why don't you look around and tell us what you find? Or even tell us what you find, but only if it's this criminal stuff. We don't want you to rummage through his diary. But if you see evidence of crime, then do that. That would be a Fourth Amendment violation. Because the government, it's not coercing, but government is merely requesting, merely speaking in order to request this private, what would otherwise be a perfectly constitutionally permissible private search. Uh, because it's a, a government request, it becomes a government search subject to the exclusionary rule, subject to the Fourth Amendment. So what do you think is the right analogy? I'm not sure. Genevieve, you're up. Okay. Um, on the question about politician speech, you know, I'm torn about this because there is a tradition of uh, treating the speech of political candidates as special on the view that the members of the democratic political community have a enhanced right to know what the people who are running for office have to say. And so when it comes to broadcast radio and television, it has long been a part of federal law that there is a right of access for political candidates in a certain period before the elections. And this is a pretty muscular right. They they have the right to equal access to any other political candidate. They have the right to purchase time on the networks at the lowest unit rate. They have all these special rules. The networks have to keep a list to indicate what their, you know, when and how the uh, political ads have appeared on their on their uh, on their stations. And so that is good precedent for the Florida law, which says the platforms can't kick candidates off in a certain period before the elections, and I'm sure was written about uh, in order to get Trump onto the social media networks. 
I guess I'm not such a, I think that there is reason, so there is analogy to that, and I understand the logic. I think that is written at a time, though, when there were very few options for disseminating your speech to mass audience that political candidates had. And so being kicked off NBC or ABC or one of the major networks was a major harm to the campaign. I think that is much less true today, although obviously it is still true. Trump getting kicked off Twitter was not an insignificant political effect uh, event for him, although, of course, also, it has not ended his career in any way, but it did make it harder for him to speak directly to a mass audience. Um, I am more in favor of a rule, an anti-viewpoint discrimination rule, like the one that Texas has required, uh, so long as it's properly drafted, which would say political candidates are subject to the same rules as everyone else. They cannot be kicked off because they are political candidates or have viewpoints that the platform doesn't like. Uh, but so long as they are treated uh, equivalently as everyone else, if they violate the, whatever the rules, and these rules are relatively are, are sufficiently uh, neutral, uh, then that's okay. So I think that's a better approach, but I do understand. And I think it's important to remember that the Florida law does not come out of nowhere, that there is a long history of treating political candidates as special. On the jaw burning point, I think jaw burning is a really big problem. <laughs> I think it is the great underappreciated free speech problem in the American tradition. Once you start looking through the history of this state, you see lots and lots of efforts by police and prosecutors and local city councils and mayors and then state and federal governments to pressure private uh, speech intermediaries into taking down speech they don't like, sometimes to boost it. Nixon uh, pressured the networks uh, at the end of his time in office. He thought that there wasn't enough favorable coverage of him. And so there's these memos in which he or someone from the White House is calling up the television networks like every day to criticize their coverage and to pressure them into putting up more um, pro Nixon coverage. So it goes both ways, but it's particularly common when it comes to speech suppression. And I think we should be very wary of this. But as Eugene said, there is valuable communication information shared between the platforms and or the television networks or the newspapers and the government. And so the rule cannot be that anytime the government communicates with a private speech intermediary about speech on the platform, it violates the First Amendment. Um, it has to be a more nuanced rule. I, th I think up until very recently, courts had had a very narrow rule because they're not quite sure how to navigate this tightrope between uh, you know, allowing there to be good communication between these two very powerful actors and um, you know, vindicating First Amendment values. Um, and I think this is an area where there needs to be a lot more thought and work, um, but I think it's a real uh, a problem. And for those people uh, who are lefty, uh, who think that, you know, the jaw burning hype is sort of silly because right now it's being pushed by conservative voices who are worried about the Biden administration and its role in getting anti-vax and um, um, articles about the Hunter Biden laptop uh, scandal uh, taken down off the platforms. Um, I, if Trump gets back into office, I think there is very good reason to think that he will use all the powers at his disposal to try and get speech that is critical of him off the social media platforms. Uh, and so I think uh, everyone should be worried about this. Well, I think we could go on for another couple of hours. I've got a lot more questions, but we're out of time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for viewing. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you at our uh, event on Friday on the question of Trump's potential disqualification under the 14th Amendment. Thank and thank you, you Rick. I very much appreciate it. Please thank our. Thanks for having me. Bye.